Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. And today I'll be talking to you about one of the most common mistakes I see on biopsy submissions, and that is mixing up inflammatory cysts and dentigerous cysts. But first, you've gotta start with that disclaimer, which is that all of the views expressed in this video are completely my own and do not represent those of any institution that may employ me. And also this video is meant for educational purposes only and not as medical advice. Should you have any concerns about your oral health, please see your nearest oral health care provider. And with that, let's get into today's video. So today we'll be talking about one of the most common mistakes that I see when clinicians submit biopsy specimens for examination under the microscope of two of the most common pathologic entities that we see in the jaw complex, and that is the inflammatory cyst and the dentigerous cyst. And we'll be talking about the differences between the two and why that is important. First, we'll talk about the most common cyst of the jaws, and that's the inflammatory cyst. The inflammatory cyst usually occurs at the apex of the tooth after the pulp, which contains the nerve and the blood vessels, dies. Now, this usually occurs after a very large cavity has made its way through the enamel, the outer surface, the dentin, the middle surface, into the middle portion of the tooth, which is kind of like the lifeblood of the tooth itself, and that is the pulp. Now, the pulp, which contains the nerve and the vessels that supply that tooth to keep it alive, when it becomes infected, it goes through a process called pulpitis, or inflammation of the pulp. Eventually, that pulpitis, or inflammation, is so severe that that pulp cannot repair itself. At that point, the pulp begins to die. We call that pulpal necrosis once the pulp is dead. Now the inside of the tooth is like a hollow tube. And at a certain point, the pressure from all of the inflammation and infection becomes so great that it has to escape somehow. There's usually a very tiny hole at the apex or tip of the root of the tooth and that allows some of that inflammation and infection to escape. This further recruits inflammation from the bone complex to try to wall off this issue. Initially, there isn't an epithelial lining and that is called a periapical granuloma. And that's usually the first lesion that we see if we see a radiolucency associated with a tooth root at the apex. Now, it's important to note that the foramen, that is the opening for, between the tooth and the outside bone, is not always located at the tip of the root. Sometimes it's on the lateral root surface as a lateral root canal. And that means that this periapical granuloma can form either at the apex or the bottom of the root most commonly, but it can sometimes form on the side of the tooth itself in a lateral position. Over time, inflammatory mediators or signals from the body itself try to recruit epithelium, which is kind of like the surface that we see. It tries to recruit this epithelium to come and wall off all of this inflammation that's sitting in the bone. Now, the epithelium that is recruited is thought to become coming from the rests of malassae. Now, the rests of malassae are very interesting. They're actually part of the epithelium which creates the tooth. Initially, teeth develop from a single cord of epithelium or surface that pushes into the connective tissue in utero. Now this is called the dental lamina. Over time, the dental lamina will give rise to the other tooth structures, but some of that gets pinched off and left in different portions of the jaw. In the gingiva, we call that rest of series or serrae. In the periodontal ligament, which is the area that connects the tooth to the bone, kind of like a hammock, we call that rest of malassae. Now these rests of malassae are what we believe is recruited to try to wall off all of this inflammation at the apex or lateral area of the tooth, creating an epithelial lined inflammatory cyst. The inflammatory cyst is a reactive lesion meaning it's reacting to some sort of stimulus, most commonly the dead or necrotic pulp. Now this is in stark contrast to the dentigerous cyst, which is a developmental lesion. When teeth erupt, 
they're surrounded by a sort of protective blanket, and we call this the follicle. All erupting teeth are surrounded by a follicle before they enter the oral cavity. And this acts as a protective barrier for the enamel or outer white portion of the tooth. And that's because enamel is extremely fragile and susceptible to outside forces. For instance, if you have a fever or some sort of infection while the tooth is developing, then the enamel can be affected permanently. So the body's natural defense is the follicle, which protects that fragile enamel. Sometimes excess fluid can accumulate between that follicle and the developing tooth. This will create a hyperplastic follicle or an enlarged follicle. Now, eventually that enlarged follicle is considered a cyst because it has become so large. Now, this is kind of a gray area in pathology, but most people agree that about three to four millimeters is the cutoff between a enlarged or hyperplastic follicle and a dentigerous cyst. While a dentigerous cyst may happen with any tooth, they most commonly occur with the third molars, which we also know as wisdom teeth. When they become so large, this can result in impaction, which is the inability of that tooth to fully erupt into the mouth. And that is why many people have to get their third molars or wisdom teeth removed, because they are impacted by this hyperplastic follicle or dentigerous cyst. Now here's where things get tricky for the pathologist. When a dentigerous cyst becomes inflamed, either through inflammation from a neighboring tooth, partial eruption into the mouth, or surgical manipulation, it is virtually impossible to tell the difference between an inflamed dentigerous cyst and an inflammatory cyst. So why is it important to know whether or not a pathologic entity or cyst in the jaw is an inflammatory cyst or a dentigerous cyst? Well, here's a few considerations. First is documentation. You want to make sure that you're documenting all of your procedures accurately in the patient's chart. Now imagine a patient comes in with a periapical radiolucency and a dentist performs a root canal or endodontic therapy on a dentigerous cyst. Now an erupted tooth will not have a dentigerous cyst. This is a misdiagnosis. This is not just important for billing, but also important to make sure that you are accurately documenting the patient's presentation in their chart and justifying your procedures accordingly. Another consideration too along these lines is if you're referring this patient for further care to a specialist, either an oral surgeon for extraction of a tooth with a dentigerous cyst, or to an endodontist for endodontic therapy with a periapical or inflammatory cyst, you want to make sure that you're giving the correct suspected clinical diagnosis to that specialist. This ensures that you have clear communication between the team taking care of that patient. Second is the proper construction of a differential diagnosis. Now, while these are far and away the two most common cysts in the jaw, there are other things that can present as these lesions that you must consider when making a differential diagnosis. Now, there is some overlap between the differential diagnosis. The odontogenic keratocyst, or OKC, is sometimes considered the great mimicker, and that's because it really can look like anything in the jaw. However, for example, an ameloblastic fibroma is going to mimic a dentigerous cyst, not a periapical cyst. So a pathologist that's looking under the microscope at an ameloblastic fibroma might become a little confused if the submitted differential or clinical diagnosis is an inflammatory cyst or a periapical cyst. It's much easier for us if we're getting a very accurate clinical and radiographic description when we have our biopsy specimen so that we better understand the context of the tissue that we're looking at under the microscope. When in doubt, it's always a good idea to submit a full radiograph, either a pan or a periapical radiograph uh, to your pathologist so that they better understand what is occurring. I always like it when our clinicians submit a radiograph because it gives me a very clear picture of what's going on under the microscope. I'm able to correlate the clinical findings, the radiographic findings, 
and the histopathologic findings to create a clear and complete picture of the pathologic entity. Hopefully that provides a better understanding of these two very common cystic lesions of the jaws, and I'd like to thank my oral pathology colleague, Dr. Katie Higgins, who suggested the topic for this video. If you have any suggestions as to what you'd like me to discuss, feel free to leave that as a comment, and don't forget to subscribe. Thank you for watching, and be well.